It's the Emma Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world. Welcome once again to the Emma Blackwell Show. Before we begin, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. This episode is brought to you by BookBannersEtc.com and Willow Kestrel Jewelry. If you enjoy the show and would like to become a sponsor, you can contact me directly at emmett.blackwell at gmail.com. On this episode, I have film director and producer Chad Archibald to talk about the film he directed, The Heretics. He has directed such films as Never Lost, The Drownsman, Ejectra, Bite, and The Heretics. Variety Magazine has said Archibald is certainly a talent and never lost as a remarkable debut. Chad is the co-owner of the award-winning Canadian film production company Black Fawn Films. They feature more than 18 feature films and have really made a mark in Canada and the U.S. Their movies can be found on Amazon, Netflix, Google Play, and wherever else you can find movies like this. They have worked with Lionsgate, Sci-Fi, Hulu, Anchor Bay, and recently with Breakthrough Entertainment and Uncorked Entertainment. Some of their films include Hellmouth, Sweet Karma, Kill, Psycho Ward, Let Her Out, Antisocial, and Antisocial 2, as well as many others. They have achieved multiple awards for Special Effects, Best Screenplay, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Feature, just to name a few. They have been featured in many film festivals, including, but not limited to, the Fantasia International Film Festival, Toronto After Dark, Chicago International Film Festival, Fright Fest, and the International Horror and Sci-Fi Film Fest. We are very excited and very pleased to have Chad Archibald on the show today. So without any further ado, let's begin. Hey, Chad, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? Pretty good. So now how long have you actually been making films? Uh, I started in about 2002 and it was, uh, you know, I never had film school or anything like that. I just, uh, one day me and my buddy decided that we were going to, uh, just make, make a horror movie. You know, we love horror movies. We collected horror movies. You know, we were the guys that went out to all the, uh, garage sales and picked up old VHSs and, you know, we had our walls covered in horror films and yeah, we just loved watching them. And then one day we were like, eh, it can't be that hard. Right. Yeah, so he, uh, yeah, we just decided that we were going to make one. We went out to uh, the bookstore and got Filmmaking for Dummies, that yellow, <laughs> little yellow book. And uh, sorry, no, we started, we got Screenwriting for Dummies. Then we went and we, we wrote a script and it was like, you know, so it was like 130 pages. It was just like littered with mistakes, whatever. And we had no idea, you know, what a page count, what a good page count would be or anything, right? And then we uh, we went out and we got filmmaking for dummies and, you know, we went online. But back then, 2002, it was like there was no YouTube. There's nothing like that to really like research stuff with. So a lot of it was just like trial and error. We just dove into it and made uh, so many mistakes. <laughs> That's the best way to learn, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're a, a Canadian filmmaker and you put together some amazing scenes using the Canadian countryside as a backdrop. Have you discovered that that untouched nature of Canada favors well for film? Yeah, it's a, it's funny because it's like when I look at it, it's just normal. Like I grew up in the country. I grew up with like, you know, big, like white wastelands of snow. Um, and it's just it's so normal for me. That like whenever I watch movies of you know in in different areas of the world, I'm like, wow, it must be so amazing to be able to capture like those those great things. It's always interesting when people talk about Canada, because I know I know we live in a beautiful country. I love Canada so much, um, but a lot of times it's like you know we aren't even filming the the amazing parts of it. We're we're trying to kind of go for like a desolate kind of like secluded cold wintry feel like you know think you're dead then also in like like the heretics it's uh you know it's it's literally my sister's backyard where this forest is where we have you know where we filmed a large part of this movie yeah it's incredible i mean the the scenes are amazing now you co-own the company black fawn films what other movies have you produced and directed uh i directed uh i'll go through them uh i co-directed desperate souls that was our first one uh kill then I directed a movie called Never Lost, um, Ejecta. I co-directed with Matt Wheelie. Uh, then did a movie called Bite, a movie called The Drownsman, The Heretics, and Now Take Your Dead. So wow. those are all the films that I directed. And then um, 
I produce films as well through Black Fawn Films, um, and a lot of them are films that uh, my uh, my partner uh, Cody Callahan he directed as well. So we did Letter Out with him and Any Social One and Two. Uh, as well, we did Better the Dead with Jeff Mahar, um, the sublet. Uh, yeah, wow. Bell Enforcers, Bounty Hunters with Trish Stratus and Patrick McBrady. We've been doing it for a while, though. Wow, amazing. Now, your most recent movie, The Heretics, the main character, Gloria, is kidnapped by a stranger who claims to be part of a cult that's hunting her. Okay, his goal is to protect her, but she begins to change. Her family and her friends start a manhunt to find the to find her and the abductor. What helped inspire this story? Uh, it's funny because it, it it started as an entirely different story about this guy who kind of like, you know, has some mental issues and just grow grow up in this house. He's like still living in the same house that he's like was born in. He was probably around thirty four, and he was like always looking out to the outside world. And he started having these seizures and thinking that God was telling him that he needed to kidnap this girl because she's going to be turning into an angel and he goes and he kidnaps this girl and there's, you know, it goes down this whole story, but it's very contained in one house. Um, and we were working with a company called breakthrough entertainment and we kind of went back and forth about the idea and it felt like a little too contained. Um, and we wanted to kind of branch out and kind of play with the idea of, you know, going out into the world. We had just done a movie called letter out and we had filmed it in Toronto with very small crew and really embraced kind of, you know, the epic huge shots of Toronto and the city and whatnot. So, um, we kind of started pulling elements from different, um, inspiration from different things. Like I love the movie prisoners. Uh, it just has such an amazing, just captures such an amazing feel to it. I also love, uh, cult films like, uh, kill list. Uh, so we kind of just, you know, took a lot of the films that we, uh, that I really liked and try to kind of mush them all together and, and find something that, you know, I wanted to make, but also that was like, you know, unique and still different. We had a, we had signed an eight picture deal with, um, breakthrough entertainment. So within like two or three years, we were producing eight feature films. They're all horror films. They're all fairly low budgets. And we were creating, you know, the majority of the content for them, me and Cody. So, you know, after this was, I think the fifth, fifth or sixth film in the in the eight film slate and we were always trying to you know make something different than the last one it's like what didn't we do we did like body horror with bite and you know we did this with that and this and, you know we did all these different ideas and a cult film was something that we hadn't really done before so that was uh kind of where the inspiration started and then you know left from there and i watched a, a ton of cult films which uh was super interesting i i go to the gym and watch like a movie on the treadmill every morning and it was like i was a weird guy that was like watching horror films at good life fitness you know mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's quite amazing now we're going to take a listen to the trailer and uh anybody who's out there who's who's listening um this is a very unique story so uh here's a trailer for the heretics they took you five years ago and they put something inside of you now, they're coming back for you, tonight, to finish what they started. The night they took you, if you could go back, would you take another street? No nightmares, no support group, no me. They're coming for you, tonight. She wouldn't run away, someone took her. We'll look around, we'll canvas the area. Maybe somebody saw something. Maybe we'll get lucky. The last time anyone saw her was 2 a.m. this morning. Hand these out. We need a fighter. What did they do to me? Something's happening to me! I need to protect you until the sun rises. What did you say? You promised me the sunrise! Where are you going? Gloria is still out there to watch giving up! Ah! 
All right, we are back. And I just saw this movie last night, and I have to tell you, Chad, I was blown away. The first thing that I was blown away with was the acting. And I was really surprised about the characterization that you put into each character. There, it's You don't really have a lot of time that you're working with during this film, but you were able to put in characterization. And I think that kind of is one gigantic part of this entire story is the characterization. So now... With all that taken in mind, how long did this take you to actually film this entire movie? Uh, we filmed it in 18 days. Wow. Yeah, we usually we film a lot of our films in 15 days. Uh, this one took 18 days up in the cold, cold uh, Aurelia North here in Canada, in Ontario. Wow. Yeah, see, I'm from Michigan, so yeah, we, we feel it, just not as bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it took a long time for us to actually write this. Like mm -hmm. throughout, um, you know, doing this slate of films, we were creating content and having writers working with writers to actually get scripts ready that we can go and, and film them. Like, for example, Bite, we, I think from the time that I pitched the studio to the time that we were on set filming was like six weeks or something. Like it was just, it was a crazy turnaround on some of these scripts. Um, but a lot of those scripts, because they were, you know, non-union scripts, they were very, you know, meant to be low budget, um, but really utilizing, you know, our strengths and whatnot. A lot of them didn't really have a ton of um, really character and dialogue and stuff, just because you never know what kind of acting talent you're going to really, really be able to to bring into the film with, with non-union actors. Um, whereas this film, we knew that we needed to kind of go into the union pool and really try to get some some really strong talent um, so that we can do it. So this is a this one's a lot different than a lot of the other films that we did. And we really wanted to embrace bringing in like, you know, some really unique, strong characters and um, some really dramatic moments that, you know, I, I think that we don't have as much of in some of our past films. So, you know, with us, it's growing as well. You know, we want to keep growing with all of our films and, and keep making each one feel unique. And I definitely feel like this one feels unique compared to the, the other ones that we've done. Yeah. I was, I was blown away. And from all the years of theater that I've done, when you have, like, let's say two or three characters in like a, a trio or a quartet um, acting on stage, you have the opportunity to really pull in the characterization of each one of those people's lives. And you did it excellently. I mean, the majority of this is, is almost filmed within a cabin. And the greatest part is, is that you're able to explore the character's past lives and surprisingly you were able to throw a plot twist in there which kind of was like whoa this has got way more going on than what i thought it was ever going to have um so i was really surprised now um you create horror movies now but i'm curious when did you start having the fascination with all the blood and gore and <laughs> what horror type movies did you watch growing up uh i started watching horror films when i was super young I, uh, I think my, my mom just realized that, you know, it, it was something that kept me quiet. Other kids like cartoons. <laughs> me, I liked horror films. I'd sit there and I'd watch them. I'd love them so much. I remember I used to have like nightmares about them, but I would never tell my parents because I didn't want them to like stop, stop me from watching them. Right. Um, but I, you know, I had, I had a huge collection when I was young. Um, you know, they were in my closet away from all the other kids so that if, uh, if I had friends over, I didn't get calls from their parents of, you know, them going home and saying, these are the films that are like, these are the, like, the, the pictures in Chad's bedroom. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I loved like Nightmare on Elm Streets and, you know, all those kind of su supernatural villains, like the classics. Um, I loved them so much when I was a kid. Like Chucky is like, for me, it's like, that's like, it's like a cartoon of horror films, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Know, it's obviously very horrific and whatnot, but it's still like, you know, as a kid, I was like, this is awesome. It's like a toy that comes to life. You know, I loved the Puppet <laughs> Master movies. I loved. I loved all that stuff. Yeah, um, they never really I, had the the Saturday morning horror cartoons. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a market there, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so now a horror film, I mean, you know as well as I do, that's as good as good or as bad as how much work you put into it. Now the acting, the music, the sound effects, the special effects, and your films rely mostly on non-CGI effects or practical effects to create the scenes. What types of techniques did you use? And did you learn some new ones along the way with this new film? Yeah. I mean, every film that we do, we try to like, you know, we, we do love gory stuff. Um, you know, not so much like blood gory, like, you know, cutting off limbs and all that stuff. We actually really don't have that much of that in our films. Um, we have a lot of bloodless horror, but, or, or like gooey horror. Mm -hmm. We did a movie called bite that was like, 
about a girl who got bit by a bug in Costa Rica on her bachelorette party. And when she came home, she started turning into this insect and turns her house into a hive and starts laying these eggs everywhere. Um, and it was so much fun to make and it was all practical effects. And, you know, we just had an actual set that was like turned into a hive and we had these eggs everywhere, these little gooey balls and everything was covered in slime. And it was just so much fun to film. <laughs> and it was all practical because, you know, like, like we love doing stuff practically just one, because we came from, you know, that era mm -hmm. but also just because it's like you know that you have it like when you're filming it you know you have it it looks great whereas like you film something and you know there's going to be visual effects in it you know well our budget isn't great you know we never know how this is going to turn out but i you know fingers crossed and sometimes it doesn't turn out great you know and we've had to cut scenes out of films before because you know we relied on visual effects that were just a little you know too expensive for our budget um but i mean in the end it's like i i would rather see something practical i love movies when they do things practically and like you know use movie magic to actually make it and not just you know computer animation yeah i tell you the the transformation that glory goes through in the heretics is quite amazing because for one you, you start out with this normal person and, and it's just it's like progressive very progressive and as i'm watching this thing i'm i'm knowing in the back of my mind, and I'm not sure if everybody else is like this who listens to the show, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how are they doing that? What are they using? What kind of, a, it's like, it's really cool because of the fact that you, you go through the progression, the, the slime and, and all, all that stuff. It's just like, wow. And, and it's the little details that really matter, I think, because you, you make a point to, to progress in a way that, that really gives the viewer almost like a, a feeling, you know what I'm saying? It, it, they, they feel empathy for the girl, but at the same time, you know, you've got these wings protruding out of her back. I mean, you almost get like visual mental pains from this because you're like, oh gosh, that would hurt. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's really cool. Now, um, we will be right back. And when we do come back, we'll be talking about um, the other films that you've produced. Um, so we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Have you ever found yourself looking for a gift but just can't find something that's unique and different? There are many online shops to find jewelry, but most of those sites carry manufactured creations that are mass-produced. The internet is at your fingertips. You shouldn't have to travel through all the realms to get something amazing. At Willow Kestrel Jewelry, you will find handcrafted creations. Whether you are looking for a wire-wrapped pendant, natural shells, or beautiful precious gemstones, you will find it all at Willow Kestrel Jewelry Shop at Etsy.com. Willow Kessel Jewelry uses genuine gemstones, including amethyst, moonstone, citrine, rose quartz, laramar, malachite, sapphire, and many more. You can make it rain with gemstones. I know I did. And it felt like I had been transported back in time to when me and my friend had to take a ring back to a mountainous volcano and toss it in to save the world. Now you can use the coupon code BLACKWELL20, that's Blackwell with the number 20, to save 20% at checkout. Search Willow Kessel Jewelry under shops at etsy.com today. In a world full of obstacles and haphazard graphics, one company has broken the mold of building amazing book covers, banners, video trailers, and more. Book Banners Etc. is your premier source for the most epic designs. Constructed from the mind of independent author Lynn Lamb, Book Banners Etc. is dedicated to making your dream a reality. They offer an array of marketing materials at affordable prices. If you're looking for book covers that pop, Banners that captivate, swag for signing, and alluring video trailers stop by www.bookbannersetc.com. That's bookbannersetc.com. Imagine your world, then make it epic with www.bookbannersetc.com. All right, and we are back. So what was the very first film that you either produced or directed? Uh, it was a movie called Desperate Souls. And uh, that was the film I was talking about where, you know, we went out and we just decided that we were going to learn how to be filmmakers. And, yeah, we went out. We said we actually – we went and we casted some of our best friends in this movie um, just because we were like, you know, what are – I don't know. A movie hadn't been made in the, our town before. I lived in a small town called Guelph, small city. Uh, but there, were, there hadn't been a movie done there before at all. So there was like no film really infrastructure other than a, a small company called Ed Video. Um, but we went out and I remember we casted Ryan Barrett, 
who is actually one of the stars of the heretics mm. uh, in our first film, just because he was our best looking friend. He was just a, a guy <laughs> that, you know, we were like, Hey man, he was a singer of a band. He was a good buddy. And we we're like, do you want to come be in a movie? And he's like, sure, man, I think I had drama class once or twice or whatever. And you know, he, uh, he fell in love with it and, uh, and all the rest of the cast as well. Like the word got out um, that we were doing, this movie in Guelph, I had people coming up to me and like doing crazy auditions in bars and like, you know, just spur of the moment kind of thing. It was really exciting. The whole town, like the whole city got really excited for it. But it was funny because we hadn't still hadn't filmed a movie. We still hadn't shown that we could even do it. We just started telling people that we were going to make a movie. Uh, so I had went out and I pre and I bought these two cameras that had just come on the market. They're very, you know, prosumer small cameras, but they were really cameras that, that changed a lot of, a lot of things by, you know, boring techie stuff but um we went out and we were like all right we're gonna film this movie we went out we were gonna film it in like a week or two weeks or something like that and it ended up taking years to film the whole thing um and we made every mistake in the book we didn't even have a boom mic on set like we had nothing we we did everything wrong that you could possibly have could do wrong but we loved doing it so much. We were like, you know, we went and we, we spent so much time and effort trying to figure out our mistakes, reshooting stuff, going back. The cast was amazing. They all stuck with us. And, um, you know, then we got the whole movie done and kind of completed and, you know, showed it to someone in, in Toronto. And they were like, well, where's, you know, this sounds horrible. Like you can't use the sound. You need it. like split tracks and all that. And we were like, OK, so we went and we built a sound booth in our basement. And just like we were living in this kind of like townhouse. It's just a bunch of us buddies and uh in our basement it was all unfinished we built this sound booth and we re-recorded every piece of dialogue every piece of like every footstep every piece of foley every clothing movement everything in the entire movie and um finally got it done it took about eight months to do that finally got it done mixed it all in her basement just on like our regular computers and then we went and showed it to um, a sales agent, and they took it and sold it to Lionsgate and Alliance Lannis, and it got it went all over the world. Wow. Um, you know, not that it was a great movie, but back then you could kind of sell anything. <laughs> um, and we and there was some really cool stuff in it, you know, and we really cared about it. We really loved doing, it, and we as soon by, as soon as we finished, we were like, all right, what's next? What can we do next? <laughs> and we jumped into the next one, and ever since then, it's it's been a, a passion, and you know, I I love every film. I love going into every film as much as I love going into that one. You know? Yeah, definitely. So now on this show, we've had a lot of independent authors. Okay, each one of them has an extreme passion for what they do with their writing, um, just about as much as any mainstream author. Okay, and they're very comparable in a lot of ways. Do you have the same passion for your productions as, let's say, a, a a Steven Spielberg out there that, that works on their films. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy because it's like a lot of it is actually just prep. Um, like when you can, when you have the money to actually go and like be able to prep your films and storyboard everything and do all those things. I mean, those are things, a lot of the stuff is stuff that we dream of doing that we aspire to do. Um, to, to just have that kind of time and resources. Uh, but I mean like every film that we do is, 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 so special to us, even like creating in creating concepts. We, um, I, I would say the majority of our job right now, uh, me and Cody is just creating concepts for films. Um, we're so hard on them these days. We're so hard on our concepts because everything needs to be so much, uh, so different. You know, there's so many people making movies out there. There's so many companies. It's the industry has kind of collapsed a little bit. Um, because there's, you know, illegal downloading and there's no more DVDs or Blu-rays or, you know, obviously they're on their way out. But, um, you know, it's definitely changed a lot and it's become very, 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 very difficult to to survive in um, the film landscape, well, uh, especially for independent filmmakers. So well, I'll tell you one thing. When it comes to your concepts, um, and this is for anybody out there who's about ready to watch this movie, each one of the cult members in the Heretics group – um, they all have different masks. And I thought that was a really original idea for you guys to come up with that conceptual, visual whole thing is that they all had different masks. They all looked as though they were kind of made out of a bark type material and also like animal um, bones and things. Very unique. Each one of them. And the fact that you guys mm -hmm. have to come up with all this stuff, it's it's crazy. But that's really it. Actually, it, like so. So, again, even with the practical effects that we were talking about it. We actually went out into the middle of the woods and built that cabin. Like the cabin is, is mm. like a real structure 
that we built and we never had any money to, to really do. We had 800 bucks or something like that to pay someone to use their barn or something. But it's like me and the production designer, we were just so passionate about it. We were just like, Oh man, it would just be so great to just build this so that we have it and it looks right. And we ended up going out and getting, uh, because we couldn't afford all the materials, um, to actually build a cabin. We were trying to think of where we could get free wood, what we could do. And we actually came up with the idea or Vince, our production designer, that we would go to like construction, uh, sites and 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 supply stores and stuff and actually take like the wooden skids that mm-hmm. they usually throw out we just took truckloads of them truckloads of them and vince sat there and him and you know a couple other uh people on the art team and just cut all the pieces of wood apart and then we actually used all that wood to build the cabin so when you look at the cabin those are actually it's all skid wood uh, that was free <laughs> you know and it, it took a long time and it took so much effort but in the end of it it's like it's just it looked perfect it was a real cabin in the woods like you, you can't fake that there is like you could shoot at any angle you wanted and uh and it looks real like it's still actually standing like deep deep you have to actually drive through fields to get to it um but yeah you know i feel bad for the kids that stumble upon it because there's a giant pentagram on the floor and you know, <laughs> blood covering the walls and and it looks terrifying but it's still there yeah it kind of is reminiscent of that whole evil dead series yeah, yeah exactly yeah, I think they have the cabin somewhere here in Michigan. I'm not sure, but <laughs> I've been looking for it. But, um, yeah, that could definitely be a tourist site someday. Uh, you guys could build your production studio, uh, what do you call that, like a Disney World or something around there. <laughs> <laughs> or just Airbnb it, you know? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Airbnb it. There you go. <laughs> so um, now if it is one thing I know, okay, it's that – in production, it takes a team of very skilled individuals who all work toward a common goal to create something amazing. What is one thing that you and your team do differently to kind of keep you all rooted in the project? Um, it's funny because a lot of our team is actually the same. Like we, we work with a lot of the same people. Jeff Mahar has shot almost all the films that we've done. Um, Steph Copeland has done the score for almost all of our films. Um, you know, I'm either producing or Cody's producing and Chris, Chris Drew, uh, he's produced, you know, the majority of our films as well, um, since we've been working with breakthrough and then a lot of the crew as well as like the people that we, that we've known for a long time, we've done a lot of films with. So it is like, we always call it like the black phone family because we, you know, we spend so much time together. Uh, a lot of times it's like, we're shooting in some weird obscure place, like, like, up in Aurelia, you know, we, we rented a bunch of Airbnbs. So it's like a lot of the crew would actually stay together and, you know, they, they became such good friends. And I mean, the other thing is like, it's non-union crews, which I always really love because the people who are generally there, they're not there for the money. They're not there for the paycheck. They're there because they really love what they're doing and they really love, um, they really want the the project to turn out amazing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes when, once you get to like, huge films and you have a ton of money it's like it's just a ton of people that are on a list that you call and they do it because it's their job and you know they're excited to get off set you know or like you know counting the clock and being like oh that's overtime hours you know Mm -hmm. whereas uh you know what we always do is like you know we we try to keep everyone pretty grounded we work with some pretty small crews and then we also have fun little things like every film that we do we have like this this designed uh, bandana that we have and every film that we have it's a black fawn bandana every film that we that we do we get a different colored one made and we give it to everyone who worked on the film so okay. if like when someone shows up on set for i'll take your dad on day one they'll have you know a bunch of different bit colored bandanas on their on their bag or whatever and you know someone two people that don't know each other they'd be able to look and be like wow you worked on the drownsman you worked on bite and you worked on that mm. you know um, and everyone like, you know, every, it's, it's been great because everyone kind of keeps them as like a little treasure, you know, it's like something that's special. It's like, nobody gets these, you can't buy them anywhere. It's like, there's only enough made for the, the, the cast and crew. So, you know, we like to kind of do fun little things like that. Yeah, that, that's definitely cool. I remember, uh, when I was in theater, we did something similar to that, but it was more like just plain old t-shirts. <laughs> it wasn't too <laughs> elaborate, but it was, it was still cool. I mean, it kept everybody, uh, you know, focused and everything. Now, I have a question for you, and this is a a pretty big question. There's sites like Hulu, Amazon, Netflix. I mean, these guys are giving Hollywood and mainstream production companies a run for their money. Now, do you think that this trend will continue? And if so, does it help get those original ideas out into the market? 
Yeah, well, I mean, we have a actually have a distribution end of our company as well. We have Black Fawn Films, which makes movies, and we have Black Fawn Distribution, which releases them, and uh, here in Canada. Mm-hmm. So a lot of what we do is we release physical product, um, like Blu-rays and you know collectors editions of of some of these films with tons of special features, and you know we we have packages where it's like there's a ton ton of like props that are involved and stuff that you can buy online, and it's just fun little things because we're all you know blu-ray collectors and and film fans um but it's uh it's been crazy since netflix has come along how much the world's changed Mm -hmm. um and i and i think that like netflix is killing it right now but i mean everyone's trying to do this model now because you know seeing what netflix has done and you know every giant will fall at some point um i know apple's about to come out with one um disney i think when disney launches their disney plus or whatever it's actually mm-hmm. called i think it's just gonna take over everything because you know they have more they have marvel they have they have so many franchises and they're like starting to cancel all their contracts with netflix and everyone else so it's like at some point netflix won't have any of the marvel movies they won't have any of like the big blockbusters um the disney owns so i think that'll be a huge one uh but it but it is pretty tricky like i know that there's also major major companies that are now like you know they used to fight against each other and now they're trying to combine forces and libraries to be like you know if we launch our platform it's just going to fizzle out because we don't have enough mm-hmm. you know to compete against netflix or whatever um so i mean there's there's so many things changing in the landscape right now that it's uh it's it's hard to kind of guess where it goes but also like you know obviously netflix and all these all these companies are trying to create original content which is you know Awesome. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many filmmakers out there trying to kind of get in the door and try to do something. We have we have a, a TV show um, that we just signed with a company in the U.S. that we're super excited to be working with someone once it uh, kind of finds its exact home. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really exciting once you get to a certain level that you can actually go and pitch the net- Netflix and all the, the people. Um, but it also makes it very, very difficult because on an independent level, you know, at some point, DVD and Blu-ray will fizzle out. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be just collectors who are buying it. And it will just be a digital world that we're living in where, you know, if you want to create something and get it out there, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be you're either making movies very, very, like, for very little money and utilizing tax credits and things like that so that you can kind of keep making them. And there'll be like a big gap in the middle where it's like, you know, the $1 million to $5 million plus, you know, films are, are very, very hard to make your money back on. Um, it's funny because in, in, in film you kind of go and you, you can do some pre-sales and whatnot, but you generally kind of, you know, raise your money on your own. You make the movie and then you sell it afterwards in TV. You know, you go and you – sell the idea and the concept and you work with a studio and then create the TV show, you know? So it's kind of, they're a little bit reversed, but I feel like now Netflix, you know, there's a lot of people going to Netflix with ideas and it's kind of turning into like that TV scenario where, you know, they'll buy it and they'll fund it first and then you'll make the movie and they just own it in the end. They just Mm -hmm. own it after that. You you don't really go out anywhere after that. So, I mean, there's so many things changing and, and I mean, the good thing is, you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money to make movies. So anyone can still really do it if you have enough passion about it. And, you know, you can always go online and sell it, you know, on YouTube or, you know, your own kind of platforms. And I think there'll always be a place for kind of boutique boutique platforms of, uh, you know, kind of like, like Black Fawn. It's like, you know, we have a ton of films that we're putting out. And we also put out films that we love um, that we can kind of acquire in Canada. And uh, we're launching a VOD kind of platform off our website sometime soon and you know it's there, there's definitely ways to get out there um but it is about you know rolling with the punches and, mm-hmm. and trying to survive through the through the droughts of time you know until yeah. this world figures out what the next plan of, of film industry is yeah and that's another thing that really gets me too is i mean for one I, I don't know if it's maybe just who i am but when i look for a film especially on like netflix or hulu or amazon or google play or anything like that when i look for a film i'm looking for something original only because the market is so saturated right now with remakes and all kinds of uh, recreations and sequels. And I'm just, I'm honestly, I'm kind of out of the superhero phase. I've been out of the superhero phase for like a year now and (laughs) I'm looking for something original. (laughs) And when I saw the heretics, I mean, for one, you had to have put some research into this. Um, it was remarkable 
the visuals you put into this. And I, I can't stop saying this because it's a, such a good movie. And anybody who's out there, I want to just let you know. Um, you can check out The Heretics on Amazon, Google Play. Where else can people find this film? Uh, in the U.S., Uncork put it out. I believe it should be yep. in red boxes uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, and if you're in the U S uh, I mean, most stores should have it. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I should have a better answer for this. <laughs> um, but on court entertainment, put it out in the U S and, uh, you know, they've done a really good job, um, getting it out there. And then in Canada, black Fawn distribution, black Fawn distribution.com, um, has all of our, our films on our website to purchase as well. Wow. Well, what is one piece of advice you would give to a new budding filmmaker who is just getting started? Um, it's funny because like I learned to make movies in our backyard, mm-hmm. like by just going out and making them. And I, I always kind of say like, you know, that's the first step is actually going out and, and making something and don't expect it to be like your biggest, most amazing thing ever. It's like, go out and try to make some mistakes and, you know, try to make some films just with no money that you can really do everything yourself and really kind of learn how to edit and stuff like that. Even if they're short films, um, but then once you, you know, once you have your confidence and it's legit confidence, um, that, you know, you'd be able to handle someone else's money and someone else's investment. Um, I always say like, go out and try to meet people. Like, it's mm-hmm. amazing. Like when you actually try to like reach out to filmmakers and producers and, and whatnot, it's like, it's, it's, it's crazy how many will actually answer you and sit down for a cup of coffee or a beer or something. Um, and really try to, you know, things really changed for us when we stopped making movies in our backyard and started making movies in the industry. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we went and we were like, all right, you know, we can either go make this movie for, you know, on credit cards and hope we, hope for the best, or, you know, we can go pitch this movie to a studio. Like we we walked into Breakthrough Entertainment and pitched the idea of like, what if, uh, what if Facebook started turning all of its users into zombies? And mm-hmm. they were like, that's a good idea. Yeah, you know what? And, you know, they gave us 10 bucks to go make that movie and, and we made it and it did great. It was on Netflix. It, you know, played all over the world, won a bunch of awards. And they were like, wow, this is great, guys. And we went back and then we built an amazing relationship since then. And we were just like, you know, just kind of walked in and 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 met them. We didn't really know them or anything. So, you know, I would, I would definitely say try to try to get out there and talk to people. Try to like, unfortunately, like, you know, I want to be a director. I love directing. I produce out of necessity just because I've got good at it because I've had to produce all my own stuff. Um, But I mean, the producer in you, like you have to, you have to have a little bit of producer in you if you want to direct stuff too, right? Like it's not always just going to, you know, land on your, on your lap. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's definitely good advice. And, uh, you know, it was a pleasure having you on the show, Chad. It really was really cool. (laughs) Thank you. Hey, it's fun. Yeah. So now everybody out there who's listening, check out the heretics. It's on Amazon, Google play. Um, it was distributed in the U S like you said, by uncorked and in Canada by black fawn films, um, distribution. Uh, this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Stay creative and stay captivating. My friends. It's the Emmett Blackwell show searching the web for the most creative, intriguing and captivating people in the world.